and welcome to Pass the Hot Sauce, a Roswell podcast. I'm Lorena Rose. I'm Aliza Ora. And I'm Lisa Abigail. And this week, we will be bringing you a mini episode. I know last week in our pilot, we said we'd see you in two weeks, but surprise, it's only been a week and here we are again. We thought it would be fun to fill you in on some other interesting alien information between our regular episodes. So this week, we are here to tell you about the Roswell Incident. In this episode, you're going to hear Lisa giving us lots of great information, and that's because she really dove deep into some research on the 1947 Roswell incident. And Lorena and I are really excited to hear this information. And we hope you are too. Today, we will be talking about ancient times up until 1947. And for anyone who doesn't know what the Roswell incident refers to, well, listen to these minisodes and you'll find out. But uh, it might be helpful to know that this is the event that Max is talking about in the pilot episode when he says it wasn't a weather balloon that crashed that night. So we are going to be talking about a brief history of UFOs. Scholar Richard Stothers wrote that the UFO phenomenon had some basic characteristics. Observers see an object that is disc or spherical in shape, silvery, golden, or red in color, metallic, glowing, or cloudy in appearance, a meter or larger in size, moving usually soundlessly, hovering, flying smoothly, erratically, rapidly disappearing. These are a lot of different options of (laughs) things. There are. And the kicker to this is that he's describing UFO phenomenon in ancient history. So it sounds pretty similar to what we think of today. The UFOs have been with us at least since the time of the ancient Romans, and the sightings do have a lot of parallels to modern sightings. Of course, they didn't use the term UFO. They were more likely to describe what they saw in military terms, uh, such as an incident when a sky army was seen in 65 CE over Judea, or in religious terms, such as the altar seen in the sky at Hadria in 214 BCE, which was surrounded by forms of men dressed in shining white wow. in the sky. I like the huh. idea of the sky army right? and the sky altar. Yeah. Like, did they think it had anything to do with God or heaven? Yeah, or the gods. I think that they right. sometimes took them as signs. It seemed like there were a lot of sightings during or right before great battles. And so I think that they might have taken them as signs from the gods about what was about to transpire. Uh, And sightings of this kind have continued throughout history in greater or smaller numbers from time to time and culture to culture. And in this minisode, we're going to focus primarily on the USA. The first documented sighting in America dates back to before the USA was a country. In 1639, John Winthrop, governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, now home to our co-host, Eliza. Woo woo! Yeah. So the governor received a report of a mysterious light that was seen by three boatmen. They said the light took the shape of a swine and ran through the sky. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. Naturally. <laughs> this is the only sighting I have found that involved pig lights in the sky. But that is going to be the name of my new band. I like it. I approve. (laughs) Thanks. There was another colonial incident in 1644, but that one turned out not to be a UFO. They determined that it was actually caused by the ghost of a sailor who had been possessed by the hand of the devil. So, case closed. Oh, that explains it. Okay. Yes, absolutely. So the sightings have happened throughout our nation's history, but the modern UFO craze as we know it was born in the summer of 1947, and we can actually pinpoint a very specific incident that kicked it off. On June 24th, Kenneth Arnold, who was an Idaho-based amateur pilot, was flying over Washington on his way to an air show in Oregon. He was doing a little exploring near Mount Rainier because a Marine Corps plane had recently crashed in the area, and the government was offering a reward for anyone who found the wreckage. The reward was 
$5,000, which in today's money would be more than 57 grand. Wow. I was going to say, that seems like a lot of money for 1947. This is a fantastic incentive for people to get up in a little plane and go do some looking around. So Arnold didn't find the wreckage, unfortunately, but he did see a series of bright flashes of light. He initially thought they must be from other airplanes, but he didn't see any other planes around. These objects didn't look like planes, and they were flying in an unusual formation and just kind of darting around a lot. So he thought maybe they're military aircraft being tested. He was near two mountains, and he knew vaguely or approximately how far away from them he was, so he used those landmarks to calculate the speed of these objects, and he calculated it to be about 1,700 miles an hour. All right. Yeah, so that is at least uh, twice the speed of sound. That technology did not exist at the time. The first supersonic flight wouldn't take place until October of 1947, so it seems unlikely that they were military aircraft. I mean, unless the military secretly had that ability before they announced it or tested it or whatever in October. But that's even like supersonic. But what you're talking about is twice the speed of sound. Yeah. So Chuck Yeager's flight was somewhere in the neighborhood of 760 miles per hour, I believe. Um, From my research, the uh, Air Force didn't have aircraft that could go 1,700 miles an hour until the late 50s. So if they were testing it during this time, they were way ahead of the curve. And who knows who would have been piloting those things? Very true. Hmm. So Arnold thought this was weird. He landed. He told some folks what he had seen. And as people do, they talked. Someone told a news reporter And the next day, there were front page headlines in over 150 newspapers across the United States. Wow. Arnold had told the reporters that the objects, quote, flew like a saucer if you skip it across the water, end quote. He was describing the motion of the objects rather than their shape. But in the hands of some intrepid reporter or editor, this description morphed into the objects themselves being described as flying saucers. Mm, So that's where the... The flying saucers originated? Yeah. Uh, oh. You know, newspaper typo or misprint or... Right, misunderstanding. Creative, yeah, creative interpretation. Or someone just thought, well, this would be a really good headline. Flying saucers! <laughs> so this actually, uh, the report in these newspapers kicked off a wave of sightings across the USA. Between June and July 1947, there were 853 sightings reported by 3,283 witnesses. Oh my goodness. Uh Uh-huh. That's a lot. Yeah, so it was in almost every state and uh, even in provinces in Canada. The most common sightings were on the West Coast. California is the number one source for UFOs. Um... Although no one was calling them UFOs at the time. I mean, we do have a lot of land mass in California. That's true. Yeah, so California is actually still traditionally very high in UFO sightings, and there's a lot of speculation as to why that is. It's right near the ocean. There's a lot of atmospheric disturbances going on. Uh, there, If we were going to see foreign military aircraft, it might be make more sense for it to be on the coast. If the aliens are big fans of Hollywood movies, they might want to check out L.A. Who knows? Or of celebrities and want to see some celebrities in their natural habitat, which is what I would want to do. Yeah, the aliens are just here to see Sherry Appleby. Absolutely. Or like Chrissy Teigen, because maybe they're on Instagram, too. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, they have learned our values. (laughs) So the peak of this wave was on July 7th, 1947. There were 162 sightings on that day from 37 states. July 7th was also the day that a rancher named Mac Brazel went to the sheriff's office in Roswell, New Mexico to report something strange that he had found. I've heard about Mac Brazel. Tell me Mm -hmm. more. Well, he worked on a ranch about 75 miles northwest of Roswell near a town called Corona. And a few days to a few weeks beforehand, the timelines on this vary, he had found some metallic debris on the ranch, but he didn't really think too much of it until he started hearing the reports of flying saucers. 
And he thought, hmm, maybe this is something. So according to the Roswell Daily Record, which is the paper we see Alex reading in the pilot episode of Roswell and was a real paper, Brazel went to the sheriff and, quote, whispered kind of confidential like that he may have found a flying disc. The term disc seems to have been used interchangeably with flying saucer at this time since the object's were disc shaped. Uh, so the Roswell Sheriff contacted the Roswell Army Airfield and they sent out three men intelligence officer Major Jesse Marcel and two counterintelligence corps agents, Captain Sheridan Cavett and Master Sergeant Lewis Rickett. They collected the debris, they brought it back to the base. And the next day, July 8th, 1947, Public Information Officer Lieutenant Warren Hout put out a press release that read, The many rumors regarding the flying disc became a reality yesterday when the intelligence office of the 509th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force Roswell Army Airfield was fortunate enough to gain possession of a disc through the cooperation of one of the local ranchers and the sheriff's office of Chavez County. Action was immediately taken and the disc was picked up at the rancher's home. It was inspected at the Roswell Army Airfield and subsequently loaned by Major Marcel to higher headquarters. That is how I imagine everyone at the time read the newspaper. <laughs> I think you're right about that. That was great. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so the higher headquarters that he mentioned was the 8th Air Force headquarters at Fort Worth Army Airfield in Texas, where Brigadier General Roger Ramey, finding the wreckage to be rather flimsy and... Mm, maybe not disc-shaped, had his weather officer inspect it. So this weather officer, Irving Newton, identified the wreckage as... Drumroll, guys. Drumroll. A weather balloon! Ah. Womp, womp, womp. Hence Max's reference. Hence Max's reference. And hence everyone's disappointment. Yes. So the following day, July 9th, the headline of Roswell's other paper, the Roswell Morning Dispatch, was Army debunks Roswell flying disc as world simmers with excitement. Uh, so various papers across the country ran similar articles, and they had photos of Major Marcel and General Ramey posing with photos of the balloon wreckage. The Roswell Daily Record ran a story entitled Harassed rancher who located saucer, sorry he told about it. So Brazel, the rancher in question, said that he had previously found two weather balloons on the ranch, and this wreckage didn't look like a weather balloon to him. But he said, and I quote him here, If I find anything else besides a bomb, they're going to have a hard time getting me to say anything about it. So... <laughs> So it seems like he got a little bit of flack for this, and there are reports that the folks at Roswell got a bit of a dressing down for putting out an article that could have po caused a panic when the general consensus amongst everyone involved, including the press, was that the debris was a weather balloon and the case was closed. And no one ever thought about Roswell again. This is the end of our podcast. It's been nice knowing all of you. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. Yeah. Um, there is an interesting but really sad kind of coda to this. So Kenneth Arnold, who's the guy who saw the initial objects and his descriptions coined the term flying saucer, was involved in one of the most famous hoaxes of all time. So Kenneth Arnold was involved in the Maori Island mystery. He was invited by a Chicago publisher and got involved in July of 1947. So this is just still pretty shortly after his sighting during this wave that is still going on. He went to investigate the sighting on Maury Island, which is off the coast of Washington. And he talked to the folks who were there who had initially put out the story. He thought it was interesting, so he called out two intelligence officers to hear the story. They weren't as impressed by it, and they made plans to leave right away. On their way to Hamilton Field, their plane crashed, and the two officers on board died. So naturally, this raised a lot of questions. Uh, people thought that maybe there was a conspiracy going on. You know, these guys have come out and investigated this UFO, and maybe they brought back wreckage, and then, ooh, their plane crashed. What's the government trying to hide? So there was a thorough investigation, and it turned out that the whole thing had been a hoax. The two guys who initially said that they had seen the flying saucer had sent some saucer fragments to uh, this publisher in Chicago as a joke, 
And then when the publisher expressed interest, they just continued the story. And that's when the Chicago publisher reached out and got Arnold involved. And so this whole thing is described as one of the most embarrassing and tragic hoaxes in the history of UFOs. Um, And it sort of contributed to this idea in the popular imagination that UFOs were hoaxes and were just things that people made up to get attention. Hmm. So, yeah, I thought that was mm, really sad. That is really sad. Yeah. A sad footnote on the uh, UFO craze of 1947. Right. And that was like the very end of July. So this was kind of the the end of this wave of UFO sightings. It ended with this tragedy where two people died. Which really also takes credibility away from like any UFO sighting. Well, right. Yeah. When the most publicized cases are the ones where people are making things up and, I mean, they didn't knowingly put anyone in danger, but this horrible thing happened. Why would anyone want to go and say, okay, well, the next tip that comes up to investigate a UFO, I'll do it. No one wants to be associated with this. Mm -hmm. So that's my info. Thanks for joining us today for our first mini episode about the Roswell incident. So how did this little weather balloon mix-up become one of the best-known UFO tales of all time? Listen to our next mini-sode to find out. But first, join us next Tuesday when we discuss episode two. And don't forget, you can always find us on Twitter and Instagram at Roswell Hot Sauce. And you can contact us by email if you have anything interesting to share or if you have any ideas for future mini episodes. Our email address is roswellhotsauce at gmail.com. And until next time, watch out for those pesky weather balloons.